Hello, this is Hiroshi Mashimo, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Greetings from Boston. It's a great pleasure to be speaking with you, and sorry I'm unable to join you live today, uh, but I'll make this available, uh, the slide deck available uh, for distribution. For uh, this talk is really for patients to better understand their illness uh, and self-advocate, and also for care providers to make more rational treatment choices based on the under, understanding of the underlying pathophysiology. Uh, the main take homes I want to make are that besides diabetes, poor glucose control, medication, abdominal surgeries, uh, pregnancies, etc., may lead to disorders of gastric emptying, whether it's too fast or too slow and lead to symptoms of gastric discomfort, nausea, vomiting, and bloating. And the measures of gastric emptying, whether the timing or the severity, really poorly correlate with uh, GI symptoms and overlaps even with functional dyspepsia. The mainstay of medical therapy then is symptom-based and not based simply on improvement of some stomach emptying parameter. And these include promotalized anti-nausea, pain reduction, and addressing other coincident issues such as bacterial overgrowth or malnutrition and food aversion and the underlying inflammation and anxiety depression. And there are non-medical treatments that include herbs, so potentially electrical stimulators and G-poems and uh, tubes that we'll also touch upon. The importance of gastropathy and diabetes uh, care cannot be overemphasized since Doctors generally screen things such as kidney, eyes, and foot problems uh, in diabetic patients, but forget to ask about um, uh, the uh, GI issues, uh, mainly because patients aren't volunteering that information or are not directly asked. And symptoms can be confused also with more common entities such as gastroesophageal reflux disorder or ulcers, gallstones. Pancreatic, uh, pancreas problems or irritable bowel, and these can be manifest by uh, poor uh, oral glycemic control itself. Um, so it's very important to review medications, which we'll go further, uh, and important to realize that six, 19 to 76 percent of patients in diabetes uh, clinic report significant GI symptoms, most commonly early satiety, reflux, abdominal pain, and nausea, vomiting which are also suggestive of gastropathy. So what is gastroparesis? Well, gastroparesis is, by definition, delayed gastric emptying in the absence of a fixed mechanical obstruction of the pylorus or duodenum. But it's important to realize that this is really a spectrum of which overt paresis uh, is, uh, is in the extreme, and that there are many other pathophysiological problems, such as dysrhythmia, hypomotility, uh, dilation of the antrum, and poor fundic uh, accommodation, which uh, uh, is in the spectrum. So we prefer to call this a gastropathy uh, rather than a paretic stomach. Uh, and in diabetes, uh, we have to consider potential other causes besides the autonomic neuropathy that's occurring. And these include metabolic and endocrine disorders, the important ones in orange, including DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, for example, in type 1 diabetes, pregnancy and hypothyroidism, the various medications that we'll talk about. And with the increase in such uh, surgeries, such as bariatric and anti-reflux surgeries, clearly vagal nerve injury should be considered if in the history. And yet, uh, despite all that, a third are idiopathic, meaning we don't know why the stomach is behaving the way, uh, not the way it should be. And so what are some of the emerging key concepts have to do with the stomach that is not a simple bag, but has different areas of different function, and that the solid foods are emptied differently from liquids. And secondly, that the relationship of the muscles and nerves uh, are required to uh, have a coordinated emptying. And then that there's inflammation and uh, altered uh, sensory nerve function that is leading to some of the 
enhanced symptoms in these patients. But the understanding is important for rational treatments. So to begin with, the stomach, although there's no borders between these areas, can be uh, considered as proximal versus distal. Well, the proximal is responsible, particularly in the fundus, for a kind of an accommodation or reservoir of the food uh, decontamination. And is, this part is really responsible for coordinating the liquid emptying or the rate of liquid emptying. On the other hand, at the very end of the stomach is the outlet resistance or the pyloric sphincter, which will keep uh, this uh, small opening uh, to sieve food uh, and at the same time prevent reflux while coordinating its relaxation with the waves uh, being done by the second or the distal part of the stomach uh, that has to do with propelling the food down, churning it, crushing it, uh, and then uh, during that wave, uh, bring some of the triturated or ground up food into the duodenum while the rest are retropulsed back into the stomach for further grinding. And coordinating all this is a pacemaker, although not an isolated area as in the sinus node of the heart, but this is creating a wave that marches down at about three cycles per minute uh, down the stomach distally. And what we find uh, in diabetes particularly are various parts of dysfunction, including impaired relaxation, which leads to problems with accommodating food, decreased sphincter tone up here at the sphincter, uh, lower esophageal sphincter, which you might imagine can increase some of the reflux symptoms, the dysrhythmia, which then does not coordinate the sweeping uh, contraction wave, uh, and this area here can be either dilated or have poor uh, contraction waves or hypermodal. And this area here, the sphincter, can be either uh, uh, spastic or uh, actually quite patent and uh, not having much tone. It should, uh, so to begin, the liquid and stomach emptying is quite different. And this proximal uh, area of the stomach creates a high pressure zone which then uh, is responsible for taking liquids down to the stomach to face this low pressure distally. So it doesn't take a weatherman to mention that this high pressure uh, and the amount of tone that's created here uh, will influence liquid emptying, which does not have a delay. Uh, as soon as you start drinking uh, liquids, it will, in a linear fashion, start coming out of the stomach. In contrast, the uh, solid emptying uh, is uh, driven uh, by tr uh, food content. Uh, that is, the solid, uh, depending on its physical and chemical characteristics, had to be, has to keep getting uh, churned up, crushed in this terminal uh, antrum, and then uh, retropulsed. Uh, and this uh, requires this coordination back and forth. And some of this uh, is mediated by chemosensors uh, of the kind with a small uh, ground up food. And these chemo and stress receptors along the small intestine mostly elaborate hormones that will help to delay the gastric emptying. For example, those with high fat content are driven by CCK then to say, hey, hold on, don't let go of that uh, Mac burger with the lots of protein and meat and grease. Um, uh, there is one hormone, however, ghrelin, which will help enhance the gastric emptying uh, down. And these are all driven by these uh, sensors uh, along the, uh, the lining of the duodenum, uh, giving these hormones back. The other component of gastric emptying is really the understanding of a yin and yang relationship. Uh, and it was always thought that the essence is of contraction, that is, those that enhance gastric emptying driven by substance P and acetylcholine. But just important, if not more important in diabetic gastropathy was the loss of this inhibitory uh, motor neurons, particularly those driven by VIP and nitric oxide. And this came to fore uh, when I was involved with a mouse model, a genetic deletion of uh, two sources, uh, genetic sources of nitric oxide, the neuronal endothelial nitric oxide and the endothelial nitric, uh, nitric oxide synthase. And it turns out that the deletion of the neuronal nitric oxide synthase led to this huge stomach 
uh, that, when you open this up, leads, uh, some, can sometimes be found a bezoar, which is not a Mikimoto pearl. It's actually a concretion of food uh, that then creates a valve, uh, kind of ball valve effect and even prevents stomach emptying. Whereas that, end, uh, that abnormality was not present in the endothelial nitric oxide synthase knockout gene, uh, which looks pretty much like the control wild type mice. So this actually became the very first genetic model for a GI dysmotility, uh, and this had to do with, of course, the major neurotransmitter inhibitory in the stomach. And uh, this, we have uh, shown, uh, leads to a delayed gastric emptying of both solids as well as liquids, which was not seen in the endothelial or other uh, neuronal nitric, uh, nitric oxide synthase source. But this is also seen uh, in terms of the importance of the dysfunction in inhibitory or nitric oxide pathway in many other disorders, not just the diabetic gastropathy, but in achalasia, pyloric stenosis, even chronic constipation, and many others. Um, it's important clinically to note, though, that the, the severity of the dyspeptic symptoms do not correlate well with the, the extended delay in gastric emptying either in type 1 diabetes nor in type 2 diabetes. And uh, we can see that, you know, there are suggestive symptoms of potential pathogenesis uh, in which we see, for example, early satiety, anorexia, and food avoidance may be indeed uh, suggestive of defective accommodative reflex uh, and that some of the heartburn and epigastric pain may be more an issue of the sensory neuropathy compared to delayed gastric emptying that we classically see with, for example, nausea and postprandial vomiting. Does, health, uh, does history help? Yes. Uh, the timing, one of the things to, uh, important one to highlight here in the differential is that when it's before uh, breakfast, particularly when the stomach should already be empty, think about hormonal problems such as uh, pregnancy or uremia. Uh, and the duration can also help uh, in terms of thinking about the differential diagnosis since if it's hours to days and goes away, think about these acute infections or toxins and, and inflammation, whereas weeks to months uh, can also be suggestive of obstruction uh, or even psychogenic. And the type of vomitus that you see, if it's partially digested, also think about you know, obstructions in areas if it's undigested, also even think about uh, esophageal obstruction, such as achalasia. And uh, if bile is present, think that the gastric outlet, that sphincter down at the bottom of the stomach, may also be quite patent, open, and not uh, doing its function of preventing bile from getting into the stomach and then up into the esophagus. Feculent order is usually of stasis, uh, and that can be, of course, uh, indicative of gastroparesis. Blood is always a red flag, so think about cancer and inflammation. Uh, and we talked about the amenorrhea of pregnancy, uh, but headaches, think about brain tumors and previous surgeries. For evaluation then uh, comes from, if you think about the definition that I started with, the delayed gastric emptying can be demonstrated by the gold standard of scintigraphy, uh, but there are other ways to do that. And the absence of fixed mechanical obstruction distally can be done either by endoscopy or upper GI small bowel follow through. In its evaluation, review medications, uh, and that is very important. And uh, to begin, the gastric emptying tests uh, are made to uh, explain the nausea or vomiting, uh, to explain some of the motility like non ulcer dyspepsias. Uh, also to look at severe gastroesophageal reflux that may be refractory to medications. Suspected gastroparesis, such as in diabetics, which is the uh, topic here. Uh, suspected dumping, because sometimes dumping syndrome uh, can uh, mimic gastroparesis and symptoms, uh, and chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction, etc. So what's done with these patients? The patient is put onto a table uh, after giving a standardized, uh, usually egg beater, uh, which is impregnated with a scintillant, uh, which can be seen radiographically uh, with a counter. 
and the this counter is placed over the stomach and the outline after the meal is made of the stomach and the stomach is is traced uh, in terms of how much sentiment is remaining there over time in a normal person you see that some of the start the stomach sentiment uh, goes down so generally by two hours you should have less than 50 percent by four hours less than 10 percent of the initial sentiment in the stomach However, in the gastroparetic, you see that no matter how long you wait, even after four hours, there can be a significant amount of scintillant in the stomach. There are other gastric ending studying tests. Uh, the spirulina test, uh, the GEBT, is the actually only FDA-approved uh, breath test right now for gastroparesis. There are many others, uh, largely experimental, and for example, the SPEC uh, would require quite a set up and is uh, not available in many uh, centers other than research centers. But the smart pill is becoming also increasingly available. Uh, and the smart pill is actually a capsule, much like the video capsule, uh, but in this case has a pH sensor, a uh, pressure transducer, um, and a temperature thermometer. And what happens is upon ingestion, you could just imagine it reaches up to 37 degrees or body temperature, uh, core temperature, and then what happens is when the pill gets in the stomach, it immediately drops to a low pH where the acid is. But when it uh, gets out of the stomach uh, into the duodenum and small, the rest of the small intestine, the pH climbs because of the bicarb secretion. And then when it falls into the cecum, there's bacteria there, and because of the bacteria, it reaches an acidity and the pH is fluxes throughout the uh, travel through the colon until the temperature suddenly drops when they poop it out. And uh, that is then defining where the gastric emptying, small bowel transit, and colonic transit is. So with one, one pill, we can get not only uh, stomach emptying, but the transit times through these. Mind you, these are transit times of an indigestible solid compared to scrambled eggs used in scintigraphy or the spirulina meal used uh, in the breath test. Gastroduodenal manometry uh, is not available except at uh, specialized centers, but has a, a bunch of um, uh, transducer, pressure transducers uh, through a catheter that is introduced from the stomach down the esophagus through the stomach and into the small intestine. Uh, and much like uh, the esophageal manometry used for looking at dysphagia, um, this is uh, looking at waves. And in general, uh, what we can see is that in a normal healthy person, we see good amplitudes uh, and the coordination of some of these spike patterns with those transduced beyond the stomach into the, into the intestine. The hallmark of musculopathy, muscle problems, is that these amplitudes drop and become weak. Whereas neuropathy, in general, uh, such as in diabetes, um, uh, we see not necessarily a decrease in contraction wave as much as discoordination. So again, discoordination and neuropathy, decreased muscle contraction and musculopathy. Electrogastrography uh, can be used with manometry and the electrogastrography or EGG uh, the electrodes can be placed either mucosally or serosally. Uh, serosally would mean usually by laparoscopy, surgically through an incision, whereas mucosally can be done endoscopically. Cutaneous is simply on the belly wall. Uh, that would be the simplest, of course, but would uh, lose out on information in terms of how much is then coordinated with contraction, uh, would basically be uh, the muscle electrical uh, activity alone. But uh, this has been shown, for example, to improve with certain medications and improve symptoms. For example, domperidone given to a symptomatic gastroparesis. Uh, and we see that before the treatment, the, uh, there's very poor uh, contraction waves. But after uh, domperidone, we see this three cycle per minute uh, waves getting restored. But the EGG interpretation uh, can uh, uh, have frequency and power uh, may define abnormality in different subsets of patients. But interestingly, the positive predictive value of an abnormal EGG is estimated pretty well at 60 to 90 percent and suggests that dysrhythmias themselves may be better indicators of symptoms.
such as nausea and early satiety and then gastric emptying, and may better correlate with symptomatic responses to medication. Barostat is also not readily available in many centers, but uh, this is a way of measuring gastric volume with a controlled bag pressure, and this will allow particular evaluation of the proximal stomach, the accommodative area, and look at pressure volume relationships. So what are some of the treatments? Well, the current treatment of gastroparesis or gastropathy is first to look at the underlying condition and most importantly, to review medications. Today with polypharmacy, clearly uh, this is very important. And we also know that control of the hyperglycemia or even the vast undulation between hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, that is the glucose control itself improved, can improve some of the symptoms. And this may require perhaps going switching to insulin compared to oral agents. Um, there are certainly hydration nutrition con uh, concerns for those that are more severe and dietary changes should be done with small frequent meals with low residue and low fat and consideration of psychological measurements, etc. Well, let's go on then to uh, the review of medications. There are many, many medications that slow down gastric emptying. You'll have this in your slide set. But more importantly to consider for diabetes is that some of the diabetes medicines themselves, and in particular, amylin analogs and GLP-1 agonists can worsen gastroparesis uh, by the fact that they can also decrease or slow down gastric emptying. And this may need uh, a switch to the GGP, uh, DPP-4 uh, inhibitors, for example. Uh, we do know that some of the GLP-1 agonists, for example, exanatide has been studied and found to have far greater uh, possibility of nausea and vomiting compared to acetagliptin. Um, and this can, uh, so uh, this is uh, an important point to be made for care providers. For those that are more severe and even hospitalized, rehydration is the mainstay, and I've popularized this in a three-step program uh, in uh, various review articles that I've written. But uh, so this begins not necessarily like a progression of a surgical patient, but for diabetes in general, we want to stay with sips of, say, Gator Gator or Salty Bouillon uh, with some vitamin replenishment uh, and avoid things that are irritative, such as citrus uh, or highly sweetened drinks. Uh, and then advancing to soups that may have mild uh, carbohydrate sources, such as noodles, rice crackers, uh, and um, and uh, in small volumes, but again, avoiding fatty food. And then step three, by introduction of more solid foods, yet avoid things such as red meat and fresh vegetables and things that are fibrous that uh, are poorly handled in terms of emptying in the stomach. The pharmacological treatments are then not just to hasten uh, stomach emptying, what we call prokinetics, but dealing by symptoms so that if they have a lot of nausea and vomiting, then to deal with the antiemetics, the pain controls, and perhaps even the bacterial overgrowth. The prokinetics uh, can be uh, classified into dopaminergics, uh, the motilin receptor uh, agonists, the serotonergic ag 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 agonists, and the muscarinics. And now that we see an explosion of serotonergics being introduced, Simplistically, I should mention that the 5-HT4 receptor agonists are the ones that are promotilized, whereas the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists are the ones that would decrease or antagonize the pain or discomfort. So, uh, so that's a quickie on the serotonergics. Um, some of the dopaminergic ones also have other uh, activities, including serotonergics like metoclopramide uh, and domperidone. I should mention, though, that in the United States, metoclopramide is the only medication presently FDA indicated for gastroparesis. So anything else I, I have to say, including even the popularized erythromycin, are all off-label use. Erythromycin is actually the strongest prokinetic known, uh, but we do know because of its propensity to give nausea and even vomiting that by using lower uh, doses, we can decrease the side effects. 
uh, caution, of course, that there is some sudden death involved, uh, perhaps because of its potential cardiotoxicity, and that erythromycin quickly tachyphylaxis, that is, that you need more to get more effect or not get effect at all within days. And so uh, the actual use may require pulsing, giving a little holiday, drug holiday, and then reusing. Azithromycin or bioxins have been uh, uh, touted to have less of a side effect, and yes, it, it turns out that the actual byproduct is that actually hits the motilin receptor, one of the breakdown products actually requires acid. So caution there, if you really want the promotilide effect, you have to abstain from PPIs. Tegasrod is back, although cisapride was pulled back and can only be used by compassionate use. But tegasrod is back, used for constipation and lower GI symptoms, so uh, again, off-label use. And pucalopride uh, is also not studied yet uh, specifically for gastroparesis, but um, this is a highly selective agonist, so it avoids some of the cardiotoxicity concerns of prior serotonergic agents. Bethanicol, uh, a shout out that it, although it's been used quite a bit, uh, does have significant uh, adverse uh, effect. Um, and, um, uh, and, and actually it uh, doesn't hasten, but actually decreases uh, or slows stomach emptying because the contractions become not coordinated. So when it is used, it's often used with another prokinetic. The antiemetics uh, are largely dopaminergic. Uh, again, metoclopramide, albeit prokinetic, is also a great uh, antiemetic, uh, as well as domperidone. Uh, metoclopramide is now available even nasally, although before, if they're really vomiting, they'd be given PR or um, uh, other means, even IV. Um, and uh, there are other dopaminergics that don't have prokinetics but are used, for example, in chemotherapy, uh, nausea, vomiting. The 5-HT3, then, are the newer ones on the block. Uh, Odansetron, like, which is Zofran, is probably the, one of the uh, more commonly used ones. Uh, and TCA, or tricyclics, remember, used in lower doses, such as the equivalent of less than uh, 100 of amitriptyline, uh, will avoid then the anticholinergic effects. Uh, and we do see here uh, cannabinoids are, of course, uh, being popularized with antiemetic properties, although if you're using it every day for quite a while, uh, or even continuously, you have to start thinking about hyperemesis of cannabis, uh, which, of course, has a hallmark of uh, getting better with hot showers. For pain control, uh, again, low dose of TCA is one of those that are popularized, uh, but these can often come from uh, an autonomic neuropathy. And while indomethacin and ketorolac can also be used to solve some of the, uh, resolve some of the abnormalities in diabetes, also there's a caution, of course, that these themselves, particularly in diabetes, can cause ulcers and uh, renal dysfunction. Uh, SSRIs are often used also, paroxetine and duloxetine, uh, and it may be a double-edged sword if they're having some depressive features, uh, and, uh, but very importantly, do avoid narcotics if at all possible. The upcoming newer or newer drugs uh, potential for gastropathy would be the serotonergic agents, uh, which have yet to be studied, uh, the dopaminergics, uh, TAK906 from Takeda has recently finished its uh, studies, uh, and we're awaiting those uh, in publication. Uh, and the cholecystokinin uh, antagonists uh, and the motilin receptors opioids, again, these will be in your slide uh, deck. The motilin receptor modifier methylnaltrexone uh, has been a little bit of a disappointment, uh, but uh, is still touted for perhaps opioid-induced uh, gastropathy, uh, but not uh, perhaps all uh, gastropathies in general. Uh, Rella Morlin uh, did finish, or uh, the study was terminated, not because of lack of effect, but uh, because of company policy. There'll be others upcoming. Uh, potential non drug therapies would include uh, ginger, acupuncture, and in this P6 Neguan point is actually what's being used for this relief band, which looks like a band that. Uh, is worn at the wrist. 
uh, and then you'll hear more about uh, electrical pacing and stimulation from another speaker. Refractory patients would require prokinetic and uh, antiemetic agent switching or combining. Uh, and in very severe cases, although very uncommon, uh, uh, people would advocate gastrostomy or jejunostomy. Botox is falling out of favor, uh, and albeit that it's probably a matter of correct patient selection, it's presently not advocated unless part of a clinical trial. And gastric palms, that is gastric per oral endoscopic pyelomyotomy, much like the myotomies that's done for achalasia, could be done if there is a, an increased uh, resistance outlet. Uh, and then planting potential electric stimulator or pacer. So if you look back at the physiology then, we can understand then that, that the impaired relaxation, we can see agents that will help with that, including uh, buspirone despite its uh, central nervous effects of dizziness, etc. So sometimes not very well tolerated, tricyclics, etc. Uh, if there's dysrhythmia, then we do know that certain serotonergics can help restore some of the rhythm there. Uh, and then this contraction issue, uh, modalized would help here, including erythromycin or the motilin receptors. If this is uh, quite re um, hypertonic, then certainly ways to relax it, just as Botox or cutting through the muscle here with g palm uh, may be the issue. And of course, if this is relaxed, uh, proton pump inhibitors. You'll hear more about the stimulation system, the uh, GEMS uh, from another speaker. Uh, but clearly, uh, this may uh, have a role uh, in uh, severe uh, gastroparetics. Uh, so basically, in summary, gastroparesis is commonly under-recognized uh, uh, by care providers, uh, and patients need to self-advocate, uh, and clearly improved glycemic control can help. Uh, this is standardly diagnosed by scintigraphy, although the smart pill and the spirulina breath tests have, uh, uh, have uh, become more popularized. And of course, endoscopy or imaging study to uh, make sure that there's no obstruction distally. Um, and of course, review the culprit medications and for diabetics, particularly the amylin analogs and GLP-1, correct the underlying metabolic disorders and treatment mainstay is symptom-based, uh, that is prokinetics, antiemetics, and pain control. With that, I'll quit. Thank you very much for your attention.